It's not an overstatement to say that Final Fantasy, with its vast, monumental history and worldwide acclaim, stands to be one of the most impactful and memorable video game franchises of all time. And like many distinguished media franchises, there exist numerous recurring elements that help to embody the Final Fantasy series, such as crystals, summons, and even the fabulous prelude. But perhaps some of the most iconic symbols of Final Fantasy are its mascots. And while there are many unique and original beings that have graced the franchise over the years, one of the most famous and beloved is the Moogle. Since their debut, Moogles have gone from being what is essentially a simple setting adornment to becoming one of the most recognisable and endearing mascots in the gaming universe. And as the Final Fantasy franchise has expanded and flourished throughout the years, so too were the appearances of Moogles. But what's interesting is that throughout that time, Moogles have undergone a serious evolution, not just in terms of the role they would play or indeed wouldn't play, but also their visual style and even how they speak. So for today's video, we'd like to zero in on one of the most captivating beings in the Final Fantasy universe and walk you through the complete evolution of Moogles. Moogles would first appear within Final Fantasy 3, but that was only because their appearance within Final Fantasy II ended up being scrapped. What was then known as the Cryon was born from the mind of Koichi Ishii, who would often combine various animals together to make something original. In this case, it would be a koala and a bat, which would see the Cryon feature a small, plump, white body and purple wings. Within Final Fantasy II, they were planned to live in cold regions, but as development progressed, their sprite designs and animations, as well as details relating to the race itself, were consolidated into what would end up becoming the infamous Beaver race. Ishii would continue his association with the franchise by working on Final Fantasy III as an object designer, and it was here, after learning that the script called for a race of cave-dwelling creatures, that Ishii saw an opportunity to resurface the Cryon. Renamed to Mogri, an amalgamation of the Japanese words for mole and bat, they would end up being found in Doga's Manor, serving as the bodyguards of the wizard Doga. And even though their appearance would remain much the same, with a plump white body and now red wings, they were made into intelligent beings who even managed shops. Alongside this, when spoken to, the Mogri would utter the phrase Nia, a Japanese onomatopoeia for the sound that cats make. Final Fantasy III would only be the beginning for Moogles, cementing some solid foundations in an official sense, but in spite of their adorable and memorable nature, they did not feature in Final Fantasy IV, replaced by another critter called the Naming Way. It wouldn't be until Final Fantasy V that Moogles would make a triumphant return. They would feature an identical design, but even though that aspect remained the same, other elements were introduced that helped to evolve the characteristics of the race, as well as their wider role within the franchise. Once again acting as NPCs, this time Moogles played a larger part by directly aiding and cooperating with the party rather than remaining on the sidelines. Upon saving a Moogle in dire straits, Bartz and the party were granted passage to their dwelling known as the Moogle Village, where they lived inside tree houses. Moogles would later return the favour, assisting the party when they were trapped by X-Death within the burning Great Forest of Moor. Final Fantasy V would also bring attention to how Moogles communicated. Unlike in Final Fantasy III, they could not converse with the party, save for Creel. And that was because instead of using audible communication, Moogles used telepathy. They would still be able to make sounds however, and Final Fantasy V would see the removal of the Nya phrase, instead introducing one of the most defining traits of the Moogle, the sound, Kupo. That wasn't the only iconic Moogle element to emerge from the game though. It would also see the debut of the original Moogle theme, known as Critter Tripper Fritter, and we also saw the first appearance of the Moogle suit, used in the Moogle village to access certain treasure. It meant Final Fantasy V marked a pivotal point in the evolution of Moogles, elevating them to being a race with greater, positive purpose, and many of the traits and features introduced would carry over and be expanded upon throughout the rest of the series. Moogles would rise to greater prominence in Final Fantasy VI through the introduction of the very first playable Moogle, called Mog. An optional recruit, Mog would function as a dancer, primarily wielding spears and some daggers. And to make Mog stand out compared to previous Moogles, Yoshitaka Amano would make some pretty significant changes. 
Not only would this see Moogles gain their trademark pom-pom, which was coloured yellow in this game, but their wings would be made much smaller and their eyes were shown closed shut, as opposed to open. Mog, along with other Moogles, resided in the Nash Caves, an interesting return to the original cave-dwelling concept that was abandoned in Final Fantasy II. Once again, despite maintaining a distance between themselves and humans, the ten Moogles chose to assist Locke Cole in saving Terra Branford from the city guards. This further exhibited the trend of a symbiotic relationship between playable parties and the Moogle race, reinforcing the image of the latter as companions and allies. Alongside Mog, in the Japanese version, the ten Moogles each had names that were built around the word Mog but in the English localization, they were instead based around Ku, perhaps as a play on the Kupo phrase. It would see the appearance of Kupop, Kumama, and Kuku, who was revealed to be Mog's girlfriend. Once again, Moogles engaged in telepathic communication, with Mog being the only one capable of speaking to humans. Alongside this, the Moogle suit would return, as it could be equipped by Strago and Realm, and so would Critta Chippa Fritta, which was reworked as Mog's theme. The other huge evolution came via the localization process. In the Japanese version, the race continued to be called Mogri, but Ted Woolsey, who had been responsible for the North American localization of Square's game since Mystic Quest, decided to call them Moogles. After the release of Final Fantasy VI, everything pointed to Moogles continuing their rise, but even though they were important, there were some fundamental changes in Final Fantasy VII referred to as Mogs within the English localization as opposed to Moogles. Even though the design was similar to previous iterations, Nomura deviated away from an important trait introduced by Amano, as the pom-pom was removed. Mogs would be integrated into the game in three original ways, as rather than existing as a coherent race as in previous titles, Mogs were portrayed as unimportant toys or mascots. In the first instance, they could be found within the Gold Saucer most notably through the Mog House arcade game, which centered around a Mog called Mog, who was looking for a mate. If successful, this would introduce Mag, who to differentiate her as a female, had a pink body tone. We also got to see lots of Mog children, some of which had a yellow body tone. The next integration was via Ket Shi, who rode around on a jumbo-sized robotic Mog, and it meant that while they were no longer a playable character, Mogs would be associated with one. Ket Shi's Limit Break, oddly named Moogle Dance, as opposed to Mog Dance, would also see a small Mog dance in front of the party, healing their HP and MP. The third instance would see the player able to summon a Mog. Found at the Chocobo Ranch, the Chocomog summon would allow players to perform a powerful attack, which would see the Mog ride headfirst into the enemy on a Chocobo. Our adorable race of mascots would next feature in Final Fantasy Tactics, but within the English localization, they would again have a different name, this time Mogri. For this appearance, the design bore a close resemblance to Final Fantasy VI, but as the race perished after a cataclysmic event, Mogri only appeared as a summon. However, instead of dealing damage, like Chocomog, they instead performed more in line with Moogle Dance, slightly healing the party via Moogle Charm. Chocobo's Mystery Dungeon had a central focus on mascots, and it would see Moogles play a role. In the original version, the focal point was on a Moogle known as Atla, who would be renamed to Mog for its sequel. His design was near identical to Mog from Final Fantasy VI, and he would again perform a selfless gesture, helping to save a Chocobo villager from an evil crystal. Mog would continue to feature throughout many of the future Chocobo titles, including Chocobo Racing and the Final Fantasy Fable spin-off series, with his role becoming more audacious with each installment. Final Fantasy VIII continued the theme of Moogles being diminished within the mainline games. Not found within the story, Moogles were effectively replaced by Moombas and the Poopoo, but they were still present thanks to Minimog. A pseudo-guardian force, Minimog could be summoned by using Mog's amulet, but this could only be found via the supporting pocket station game called Chocobo World. When used, Minimog would provide the only real way for healing other GFs in battle, but even though this healing trait was similar to Mogri in tactics, the design of Minimog saw massive deviation. It would see feline features introduced, with Minimog having pseudo-whiskers, a small mane, and again, the pom-pom was missing. It wouldn't be until Final Fantasy IX that Moogles would return to playing a more prominent role, and to working with the theme of the game, which was about pulling in from the franchise's illustrious past, they would be inspired by Final Fantasy VI. 
Perhaps the most immediate reference would be the name Moogle returning within the English localization, but the design, which would use Final Fantasy VI as a base, would attempt to represent the entire franchise as a whole. This evolution was overseen by Toshiyuki Itahana, who had been responsible for the design of Mog within Chocobo's Mystery Dungeon. He would merge traits such as the Pom Pom with the more feline features of Mini Mog, and the end result was quite unique. This helped to make them much more distinguishable, but to take things further, Moogles would now wear clothing and have accessories. Female Moogles, for example, wore pink waistcoats, and some Moogles, like Stiltskin, wore different clothing pieces and had accessories, while others had full-on chest hair. Beyond that, there were a few Moogles who even had different colour palettes, namely Mog, who had an orange pom-pom rather than red, Artemisian, who had striped purple fur, and Stiltskin, who wore a camo bandana. In the world itself, Moogles were integrated into society and could be found almost everywhere, even in more desolate locations where they ran mog shops. It meant Final Fantasy VI was eclipsed in terms of the number of named Moogles who featured, as they performed a crucial function, acting as save points, as well as enabling the party to use tents. Final Fantasy IX would also introduce a specific narrative relating to Moogles via Mognet. Throughout the game, players could speak to various Moogles and exchange mail, and although it would seem like a small mechanic, it would be part of a much larger side quest that had a strong focus on narrative. Moogles also had a strong connection with Mundane Sari, where they were the sole companions of Aiko. This resurfaced a trait from Final Fantasy VII, as Moogles would be associated with a playable character as opposed to being playable themselves, as Aiko's closest companion, called Mog, would be revealed as the Eidolon, Medine. Additionally, the musical motif, the Moogles theme, appeared once again and played inside the Mognet Central, and the Moogle suit even resurfaced, worn by Lowell Bridges as he attempted to escape from his adoring fans. Final Fantasy Unlimited would feature a Moogle named Moogle Kupo. Moogle Kupo retained the generic traits of the Moogle, but would differ in that he had blue eyes and red stripe accents on his face, as well as no visible wings. He would also share some visual elements with Kaze, his old companion, donning a large cloak and a pair of glasses only half intact. Like Moogles from Final Fantasy VI and IX, Moogle Kupo played a supporting role in the story and had various skills, including the ability to augment Kaze's magun and the ability to fly. Interestingly, his pom pom would light up when these skills were activated. Final Fantasy X would follow in the footsteps of Final Fantasy VII and VIII, with Moogles almost non-existent within the game's lore. They were still present though, featuring predominantly as dolls. It would see the generic Moogle design reworked into that of a plushie, with distinct ragdoll features including sewn-on appendages, visible seams, and a cross-eyed design to emphasise their inanimacy. Lulu would then use one of these dolls as a weapon, furthering the trait of Moogles being associated with a playable character. This design was then carried over to Final Fantasy X-2, but Moogles would see a greater role within the combat system thanks to Yuna's mascot dress sphere. Adorning the famed Moogle suit, Yuna would be able to use the Kupo command ability to access numerous white magic infused techniques. In Final Fantasy XI, the role and design of Moogles was very similar to what had been seen within IX. It would see Moogles woven into the very fabric of Vanna DL, as they would manage and guide players through multiple facets of the game, acting as in-game supervisors who administer things like updates and special event items. Adventurers also had their very own Moogle custodians who managed their Mog House. There were also Moogles with names, and many were introduced via the add-on scenario called A Moogle Coupe d'Etat, Evil in Small Doses. Acting as a comical side story focused on the player's personal Moogle, this scenario would see the first instance of evil Moogles, as Raiko Kupenreich served as the final boss. Even though Final Fantasy Tactics Advance was a continuation of the successful spin-off franchise, it featured a drastically different look for Moogles. Deviating away from not just the Mogri summon from Tactics, but every previous iteration, this new version of Moogles was closely aligned to rabbits with long ears and big feet. But they did still feature wings and the pom-pom. Moogles could be recruited to the player party and they would have a red pom-pom and red wings, a trait not seen since Final Fantasy III but Mont Blanc, who would have a high degree of prominence in the story as one of Marsh's closest allies, would have an orange colour palette, distinguishing him in the same way that Mork had been distinguished in the past. Mont Blanc, as well as the design aesthetics introduced in Tactics Advance, would then be carried forward to future Ivalice titles, including Final Fantasy XII, Revenant Wings, 
Tactics A2, the Crystals Defenders spin-offs, and Tactics S. Each would introduce subtle design tweaks and odes, such as the six Moogle siblings in 12. They felt like a small play on the 10 Moogles in Final Fantasy VI, and each featured distinct colour palettes that extended to their pom-poms. Despite Idahana serving as the main character designer on Crystal Chronicles, he decided to introduce some very interesting changes to the designs he helped to cement. It would see Moogles essentially turned into physical manifestations of the pom-pom, as they were essentially floating puffballs that had no arms. The game would also reintroduce characters like Stiltskin and Artemisian, and Itahana would bring forth their colour palettes. Within the world, outside of Stiltskin and Artemisian, Moogles would assist players inside of dungeons and facilitate minigames like Moogle Paint. They also administered stamps to players to unlock the Blazing Caravan's race game, and in a fun nod back to Final Fantasy IX, also delivered mail. And in single player mode, a Moogle named Mog would carry the Crystal Chalice, resurfacing the connection between Moogles and the playable character. The role of Moogles would remain much the same in Ring of Fates and Echoes of Time, but in the Crystal Bearer, arms were re-added to the design and they even had their own dwelling, something that had not been seen for many, many iterations. The next appearance for Moogles would be a small cameo in Advent Children, and this would be interesting as it would serve as something of a small retcon. We would see a Moogle plushie, complete with pom-pom, carried by a young girl afflicted by geostigma, who would appropriately be called the Moogle Girl. This was interesting because the design was quite different from Mogs in Final Fantasy VII, instead resembling the design from Final Fantasy X. This design would then reappear in Dirge of Cerberus, with the most noticeable instance being Yuffie's hood, which also ticked the box of being a Moogle suit of sorts. In the Final Fantasy III Remake, the role of Moogles would change considerably compared to the original. It would see them feature a more modern design that was closer to what was seen within Final Fantasy VI and IX, but perhaps the biggest change was the addition of the Mognet system. As had been seen before, via the system players could send mail, but it would now be expanded allowing players to send mail to their actual friends and other in-game characters by speaking to the various Moogles located all around the world. Not only that, the Mognet side quest was crucial to obtaining Ultima Weapon, the Onion Knight job, and a bonus dungeon. Crisis Core would then deviate away from what was seen within Advent Children and Dirge of Cerberus, having a design that was closer aligned with Final Fantasy IX. After obtaining the Moogle Amulet, a specific throwback to Minimog, Moogle would appear as a potential summon within the digital Mime Waves Chocobo mode. Its move, Moogle Power, would fulfill the white magic trait associated with Moogles by casting regen on Zack, while also levelling up equipped materia by an amount equal to the attack level. In Dissidia, Moogles were more like a caricature, featuring tiny bodies, big noses and huge palms, and it was quite similar to how they had been portrayed by Nomura within Kingdom Hearts. They acted largely behind the scenes, managing the Mognet system, which, as a throwback to Final Fantasy IX, distributed letters and rewards when players logged in. And alongside various other beings from the Final Fantasy universe, they would also appear as a summon. This would be based on their appearance in Final Fantasy XI, and their special ability would see them be able to copy and randomly perform the ability of all other summons except for Shimryu. Moogles would have a greater presence in Duodecim with the addition of Moglin, who alongside other Moogles hosted Moogle shops where players could receive items in exchange for Kupo points. Though they didn't really have much bearing on the story, Sid of the Lufain would adopt the disguise of a Moogle in the game's third story mode, Confessions of the Creator. It would see Moogles as the only living beings remaining alongside mannequins following the destructive efforts of Feral Chaos. Moogles would not be physically present within Final Fantasy XIII, only appearing as an illusion via the Moogle Workshop. Its logo depicted a vastly different design of Moogles as they featured huge ears and a pom-pom close to the size of their own bodies. Final Fantasy Dimensions though, as it was based on earlier iterations of the franchise, would see Moogles closely resemble Final Fantasy VI. But throughout much of the game, their role was diminished. It would see them assist players in the acquisition of Eidolons, as well as being summonable themselves via the fusion ability called Moogle Dance. This could only be used by Warriors of Darkness, and would decrease the defense and resistance of all enemies. On top of this, after the second dimensional shift occurred, a group of Moogles would form their own dwelling called the Moogle Cave, where they would sell various items and magic. 
Final Fantasy XIV has featured Moogles ever since the initial launch in 2010, but their design, which was a blending of both Final Fantasy XI and Crystal Chronicles, has remained consistent throughout. Abundant throughout the world, Moogles were integrated into the lore as a rare race who could communicate with elementals. This would be via Moogle speak, and it resurfaced a lesser used trait from the earlier entries in the franchise. Following a terrible war, the Moogles will be split between realms. Those who stayed behind would be aligned with Good King Mogul Mog the Twelfth and would have names aligned with the word Mog, while those who left and made a new home within the Twelfth Wood would have names aligned with Kupo. And whether this was intentional or not, it did serve as a weird allusion to the localization of Final Fantasy VI, where the Japanese Moogles were based on Mog and the English Moogles were based on Ku. Outside of this, Moogles mostly retained their helpful nature, holding letters and other items for the player after certain requirements were met. They would also be featured as part of numerous quests and trials pre and post calamity, and one particular trial that was ported over would see players fight against Good King Mogomog the Twelfth. Not only would this fight be very memorable, it would also mark an evolution of the Moogle theme as it was rearranged to suit the battle setting and even included vocals. In the Stormblood expansion, we would even see references to Evolution Moogles with a rendition of Mont Blanc appearing. And outside of many, many other elements, thanks to the mount system, we also got to experience the Fat Moogle. In Final Fantasy Type-0, Moogles served as class advisors in academia. In fact, the name Moogle was actually an acronym for Military Operation Organization Guidance Logistics Expert. With one Moogle appointed to each class, there were 13 in total, and they were collectively known as the Cranberry Knights. They were also gender ambiguous, used the pronouns Z and here, and had a strong resemblance to Moogles in Dissidia, with the main difference being the clothes they wore and the adornments on their pom-poms. The most prominent Moogle was the advisor of class Zero, Moglin, whose real name was Hatshamene Lautoyosna Eripulsi, and it was through Moglin that we got to see an evolution cemented relating to communication. We'd seldom heard a Moogle speak, with Mog in Final Fantasy Fables Chocobo's Dungeon being the only prior instance. But in Type-0, Moglin interacted with the party quite a lot. And when speaking, Moglin would provide tips to the player on missions, corresponding with them over the Crystal Oriented Messaging Medium or COM, and could also initiate lectures to help players pass time between missions and receive stat buffs. After a small cameo in Final Fantasy XIII, Moogles would make a strong comeback in its sequel in the form of Mog, a guide and companion to Sarah and Noll, who had the ability to even transform into Sarah's bow sword weapon. While not necessarily central to the plot, this would see Mog act as an extension of the playable character, a trait not seen for a while. And beyond being Sarah's weapon, he could execute numerous abilities such as Mog Clock, Moogle Hunt and Moogle Throw, which allowed Sarah or Mole to physically launch Mog to closed off or impassable areas to obtain any items that may be located there. Mog would also be given a design that differed from their brief appearance within 13's Moogle Wox logo. And compared to the traditional Moogle, an interesting evolution was the addition of a crystal bauble rather than a pom-pom, symbolizing the physical connection between living beings and crystals within the 13 trilogy. As Type-0 wasn't localized until after, 13.2 would be a first for Moogle speaking within the English version, as Ariel Winter provided a colorful voice for Mog, and although some found it detracting from the experience, others found it absolutely adorable. Lightning Returns would not only see the return of Mog from 13.2, but it would see yet another Moogle dwelling within the series. The Moogle village was home to a community of Moogles, with Mog, who now wore a crown, acting as their leader. Though not heavily involved in the story, Mog would assume the absent Hope's role in managing the item shop in exchange for EP on the game's final day. Moogle attire also made a comeback in Lightning Returns in the form of a downloadable costume called Moogle Queen, which featured Lightning dressed in a suit adorned with Moogle dolls, as well as Mog's clock staff and a shield identical to his face. Moogles would next appear in Theatrhythm and Final Fantasy Explorers, but their roles were quite small, relating to gifting and making occasional appearances. You could however construct a Moogle suit in Explorers, which was a nice touch. It wouldn't be until Record Keeper that we would see the next major Moogle in the form of Dr. Mog, who was a Record Keeper and a mentor to the main character, Tyro. Sporting a traditional design, with more rounded ears and the Record Keeper's garbs, Dr. Mog would task Tyro with saving the records after darkness infected the Hall of Records. 
Dr. Mog could fully heal the party in exchange for gems or mithril, as well as acting as a roaming warrior in some dungeons. Final Fantasy Dimensions 2 would make significant changes to how Moogles were presented within that specific universe. Not only would a whole backstory be created that positioned Moogles as a race of Eidolons from Eidola, who once lived in harmony with humans during the ancient era of Mysidia, the game would also feature a Moogle named Mog who served as an attendant. Further to this, Dimensions 2 would see Moogles return to being summonable. Even though they were a dark elemental Eidolon, they provided typical utility by restoring the health of allies and removing negative status effects, and they did all of this while being the first Moogles to have multi-coloured pom-poms. In Mobius, Moogles would play a central role in the narrative thanks to Mog, who would accompany Wall throughout much of his quest. Mog's design, much like many of the assets featured in this game, was ripped right out of the 13 trilogy. But even though this was a lift and shift, we did get to see something new. In the past, Moogles had been associated with making sacrifices to help out the playable cast, but in Mobius, Mog took that to the extreme, sacrificing their life in order to fulfil the prophecy. Hot on the heels of Mobius was Brave Exvius, but even though they released so close together, the representation of Moogles was poles apart. It would see Moogles appear as units and trust Moogles, with the design resembling Final Fantasy IX, except with the pom-poms being blue and having rings around them. When called upon, Moogles would wield spears in battle, a reference to Mog from Final Fantasy VI. They would also have access to powerful white magic, could use the Mog Waltz, a reference to Moogle Dance as it restored HP and MP to the caster, and had the ability called Guardian Mog, a nod to Mog from Final Fantasy IX. The game would also feature Final Fantasy XIV's King Mog, who, within this particular lore, resided in the Far Plain alongside a large population of Moogles. He had little bearing on the game's story, but instead introduced the Far Plain and its properties, including the Vortex of Desires. King Mog also acted as a host for events, and could even be fought as a boss to commemorate the game's one-year anniversary. In World of Final Fantasy, the mascot role was assigned to Tama as opposed to a Moogle. Instead, they appeared as enemies, and in this regard, perhaps the most prominent foe was Mog, a minor antagonist who was part of Faris's crew. At this time, the player would encounter numerous coup pirates, but throughout the rest of the game and its expansion, Maxima, players would also get to encounter regular Moogles, Kupikaroons, and Glow Moogles. World of Final Fantasy would also make reference to the Cranberry Knights from Final Fantasy Type-0. Appearing as part of an intervention quest called A Duo of Three, this would see the player need to defeat the Cactor Conductor, the Master Tomboy, and Mog. Even though Moogles were planned to be part of Final Fantasy vs. 13, and had also featured within Type-0, after being reworked into Final Fantasy XV, it was announced that Moogles would not be included in the game. It led to considerable backlash, and after holding a poll to gauge interest, they were reinserted into the game, albeit in an ancillary role. It would harken back to Final Fantasy VII and X, as Moogles appeared as dolls, but unlike in those games, they were now an offensive weapon, as Noctis could throw them at enemies to act as a decoy, and Iris would use them as a weapon when performing a Link Strike. A Moogle could also be found in Cindy's tow truck, and another could be used as a lure when fishing, and in the multiplayer expansion, Comrades, the famed Moogle suit would return. Beyond that, as part of the Moogle Chocobo Carnival, players would need to take photos of various Moogles located all over Altissia, with each doll named after one of the six Moogle siblings from Final Fantasy XII. The city of Opera Omnia has featured two facets of Moogle. First, there would be an NPC named Mog, who much like in the other Dissidia games, would act akin to a guide. But where this differed was that Mog was woven into the narrative as a servant of Materia, and it would be through this role that Mog would get to know Materia's champions, developing a specific affinity with Terra. To make things confusing however, Mog from Final Fantasy VI would also be recruitable. He would use a spear and would have Moogle Rush as his EX ability as a reference back to his desperation attack from the original game. And that brings us on to the Final Fantasy VII Remake, where many elements from the original game were updated. It would see the Mogs replaced by Moogles, and the design now had pom-poms. But even though these changes were made, their role remained in keeping with the original game, and it was not expanded upon. So far, it means that we have seen the Chocobo and Moogle summon reappear, with a new move added to their repertoire called Moogle Blast, and Moogles appeared as non-interactive allies when fighting against the fat Chocobo. Yuffie would also wear her Moogle hood in intermission, 
but even though Ket Shi has featured, we have yet to see the giant robotic Moogle, and who knows if they'll remake the Moghouse minigame at the Gold Saucer. We also don't know if there are any plans for Moogles to feature within Final Fantasy XVI, but if they do, the developers will have a very wide array of sources should they seek inspiration. And that's because over the years, the Moogle has seen some distinct changes imposed. Many of the traits that we now deem canonical were first implemented by Yoshitaka Amano and Toshiyuki Itahana, but there are still distinct differences between their designs and those of the Moogles that are featured in games where Tetsuya Nomura has been the creative force. And even then, there's differences between the mainline Nomura Moogles and the spin-off Nomura Moogles, as shown by how different they look in games like Final Fantasy VII and X in comparison to Kingdom Hearts and Dissidia. On top of that, there's also the Evolution Moogles that feature an entirely different set of traits. But even though we've seen so much diversity, the few traits that have now been definitively cemented are the Pom Pom and a furry, whitish body. Either way, we hope you've enjoyed the first of what we're dubbing our Mascot Evolution series. If you did, please consider giving us a like, and as always, be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you'd like to influence the types of evolutionary studies that we produce in the future, make sure to also check out our Patreon, as supporters get exclusive voting rights on upcoming evolution videos. Alright everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. I'd love to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, Delivestream, Gregory and Zdorn, who are super special Onion Knight supporters, and of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.